2022 report from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, women represented slightly more than 42% of the food manufacturing workforce. Additional reports indicate women make up 20% of senior leadership positions at food and beverage companies. As the food and beverage industry attempts to increase and improve its post-pandemic labor force, food processing wanted to honor women and the companies they work for, for the steps they're taking to make the food and beverage industry a more diverse and inclusive place to work. Hello, this is Erin Hallstrom, host of the Food for Thought podcast, and welcome to the start of our special series on Influential Women in Food. Today's episode kicks off our series of women in the food and beverage industry that have affected change and helped to make the companies they work for more inclusive and female-friendly. Over the course of the next few months, we'll be talking with the women that were nominated by their peers to represent the industry's most influential women in the food and beverage industry. With us today is Chloann Durham. Chloann is the Vice President of Quality, Safety, and Environmental Sustainability for Coca-Cola. A self-branded science nerd, Chloann's college experience did not include visions of a future in the food and beverage industry. As her post-college experience evolved, so too did her options and she worked at several beverage companies before coming to Coca-Cola more than 20 years ago. We talked about Chloanne's career evolution and how it helped create a foundation for the lessons she's learned throughout her career. We talk about those lessons throughout this episode, from the importance of collaboration, communication, and transparency, to finding your leadership style, We talk about all of the ways Chloanne has helped pave the way for other women in the food and beverage industry, and we conclude the episode talking about the best advice Chloanne has received and would give about a career in the food and beverage industry. Enjoy the episode! Welcome to this special Influential Women in Food episode of the Food for Thought podcast. Chloanne, let's kick things off by getting to know a little bit more about you. How are you serving the food and beverage industry right now? Currently, I work for the Coca-Cola company, and my oversight is for North America, Canada, inclusive of Puerto Rico. Just really working for our, with our scientific professionals, monitoring our quality, our food safety, um, environmental and sustainability, the governance um, within the Coca-Cola system as it is broken up into many facets within our country, um, really around franchise bottlers, some non-producing distribution centers, as well as working with our customers and our consumer base. I always love a good career evolution story, so I'm curious. Walk me through how you arrived at this role, and has your background always been in the food beverage space? I've always been a little bit of a science nerd. Uh, oh. So I went through college, and science is what I studied. Never saw the evolution of going into food. Uh, like a lot of people you talk to in the sciences, they wanted to be in the medical field. But I moved overseas right after graduating from college and socialized medicine and a lot of the different attributes then. It was easier to get into a beverage company. So I started working for a brewery there and kind of found the interest of doing multifaceted roles within the technical side and the operations side. And that was early 90s. And I kind of graduated through multiple levels within businesses and operational guidelines and technical strategies and worked for a lot of different beverage companies before I started with Coca-Cola 20 years ago and really just been in the corporate setting of Coca-Cola Atlanta for a year now. But really enjoyed my background and been able to really participate in dairy, um, some of the analytical resources within the food and beverage industry concentrated beverages, one that comes back and brings back memory from my childhood is like slush puppy beverages, aerosol whip topping, a lot of different facets that kind of roll up into the food and beverage industry that really set my path at the time. I didn't recognize it, but it set me on a path 
to the corporate role here in Atlanta? Well, I, too, am a fellow science nerd, um, although I kind of deviated into journalism, um, just, you know, I was probably better at writing than I was at science, so here we are, but <laughs> I have... I, have, uh, I dabbled in the beginning uh, myself. Yeah, I love, again, I love hearing the evolution because I, I don't think most people's career paths are linear. And so I think it's important to hear all sorts of, you know, the, the different ways people arrive at the career that they're in. Um, it gives a lot of maybe younger folks, anyone, hope to like, okay, well, I'm graduating with this degree, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to be X, Y, or Z as, you know, for the rest of my life in our career. So that's awesome. So one of the things that I do know and have learned about you is that you have been a keynote speaker at many industry events where you've talked about best practices and in industry collaboration. So I'm curious, what does collaboration look like to you, and why is it important for the success of a team? I think collaboration really, I, I often think about it when I'm with my teams and with um, all the businesses I've been part of, it's really about being transparent because you don't want to work into a silo situation to where you're trying to move an initiative, but in order to get to really success, you've got to be able to partner with someone else. So I think the ability to be able to see people for the, the role they hold, but also the power that they hold, no matter what, what it is, whether it's someone that's working on the floor of a manufacturing center operating a piece of equipment, to someone who's actually leading a global company, you have to be willing to talk to them and understand where they're coming from. So collaboration really is the ability to influence through communication and be transparent in your communication. And that way you can all work together to get to your end result and be more successful. I, I quite often get a little distressed when I was part of businesses, and this was many years ago. I think businesses have evolved much better now, but where you would be in a situation, they would go, oh, I'm sorry, you're not part of the engineering team. We really can't discuss that with you. Or I'm sorry, you're not part of the finance team. But really, in order to be able to deliver a strategic goal you're working on, you had to have those influences from those different parts of the organization. So I've never been afraid to knock on doors, introduce myself, you know, get to know people. Um, I've been told many times my leadership style is really leading through people and relationships. So you can, you can lead about anything, I think, if you're willing to see people for who they are and develop those relationships and be willing to get in a room and really break down barriers. So collaboration really has to be that level of transparency and for you to recognize what the end result is. I love what you said right there. I, just so important. It was so great. So I'm wondering, gave a lot of great stuff for collaboration with teams, but how does that collaboration fit in for the success of a business? Well, I, I'm just thinking about the business I'm in now, and it's a global organization. So I'm, I'm working focused on North America, but if I'm unable to collaborate and kind of work cross-functionally with not only the company that sits in Atlanta, but also my partners who are operating globally, it's going to make it impossible to work through any reporting statistic that's required when you think about, now you hear a lot about sustainability. Well, if we're doing one thing in one part of the country, but we're doing something else in another part of the country, and we're not really talking about it and trying to collaborate to ensure what we're doing is, is, is kind of all in the same direction. Even though you might be operating at different levels of execution, you're not going to be able to bring a business along and be successful. And I mean, sustainability is just one of those thoughts as we think about how food companies are really being impacted today and really seeing the value in some of um, recycling and all the hot topics you hear throughout our system, but to collaborate really means another way to look at it is just really networking um, and having a common goal when you're networking to an end result to make businesses successful. But as an example of the global company that Coca-Cola is, it would be a huge detriment if North America was operating on a profile of, we'll say, 100% recyclability or 25% while the rest of the country 
Um, and then the rest of the globe has different measurements. So if we're operating one way in one part of the country and then the global organization in Europe or in Asia or in Africa is operating in a different direction, it's really going to take the success of the business and implode it. You're not going to be able to get where you need to be, and you're looking at an investor-driven business as well. So your investors want to know that you're able to collaborate and streamline your strategy. So I think that's a broader look as what as you look at the broader business and what makes it successful. And then when you look at the really the pieces underneath it, kind of the, the cogs in the wheel, as you might think, just kind of keeping it moving, we've got to make sure that we're all discussing. And you think about how broad North America is, it is an example. From the West Coast to the East Coast, it's very different. But our partners that are working on those pieces of the business have to be able to understand um, what their risks are if they are operating differently and how that strategy may impact the finances of a business because ultimately the message is one message. It sounds like essentially what you're saying is all of the hands need to do what the, know what the other hand is doing. You know, the adage of the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Um, all hands need to know what's going on. And also sounds like really important not to gatekeep information. Um, you know, unless it truly is private, but um, right. that makes so much sense. I want to do a quick pivot, and I'm wondering if you can talk to me more about some of the ways you've helped pave the way for other women in the food and beverage industry. I have been part of, you know, smaller organizations um, or networks within the industry where we've um, met with maybe students or I've worked with you know, women-led organizations. We've had leadership groups like international women's group. We've had leadership groups within organizations. I've been part of International Society of Beverage Technologies, and we had a women's forum where we got women together who work in the science field because the numbers were lower for many, many years. I think they're coming up. But for most of my career, I can remember I was the only female, especially working in a manufacturing um, environment. And although I didn't really see it as problematic, I look back on it and reflect and go, yeah, I was one of few. And now we're starting to see more women enter, enter the science field. But as we look at those women who are coming in and they're, they're very strong engineering, science-based um, graduates and they're trying to find their leadership footing, it's important for them to know that, you know, their voice is what's important. It's not, you don't need to recognize and try to emulate someone else. You know, everyone's an individual, and I think everyone has a lot to bring to the table. So one thing I've, I've, I think I've always recognized is I was different. Um, just like my peers, where they were male or female, were always different, and our voices is what really made the business work. You can't all look at it from the same way. You can't all come at a problem the same way. And I think that differentiation is really what makes you successful. So I quite often have conversations with young women. I really enjoy mentoring people. Um, I've been part of organizations that in, intentionally set you up as a mentor or offer you an opportunity to mentor. Um, some of the things that I've spoken with, like Sharp Hills Convention, which is a women's leadership focused convention, where you get in and kind of lead women through that network of leadership and next level executive leadership just kind of the things that are important. And I think the, the, the strongest thing is you've got to find your leadership style. You've got to find your inner leader. You've got to find what works for you. And you've got to find the right business climate and community and culture that works for you. And that's no different if you're male or female. So I, I quite often try to really take away the challenge of being a female, but really recognize your leadership capability. So I enjoy leading um, and mentoring. I enjoy helping, you know, younger individuals coming into the professional world find their voice and kind of find their way because that's an exciting point to be able to see someone develop. And I always say the success is if you're working for someone that you brought into the organization, you know you've pivoted them to that next level job. And that, that's an exciting thing to see. When you were nominated for Influential Women in Food, part of the nomination mentioned the Sharp Heels Career Summit. Can you tell me more about that and the part you played at the event? Yeah, so Sharp Heels Career Summit, um, that was really exciting. It was, it was new for me. 
and I, I did attend a couple of years, and um, one of the last years I remember being there, it was actually in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it was a small forum, all, all female attendees, and there was a lot of levels within leadership there. And we had a roundtable discussion and really talked about how we got to the position we were, reflecting on you know, what we felt like was the great values that we might have attributed to someone that led us or a culture or an environment we were in, and maybe what was some of the things that we learned that were really hard. Um, I, you know, a lot of women, are, they have families at home, and to be at work in a manufacturing center for 12 hours, which is kind of the norm in history, that was a difficult challenge, and how do you do that and still manage to become a leader in the organization? That was one of the conversations we had, and I even remember one of the young people within the Sharp Hills Convention, which is association that is focused on women and setting them up as leaders, they asked, you know, financial questions, and that's a part of that organization. It's very well-rounded. It's really trying to take executives and even top-level leaders to – go into a forum, discuss how they got there, and younger people coming into business are asking questions about how they can set up themselves to be successful. And they talk about things as, as simplistic as how to balance your budget to as complex as how do you um, manage difficult conversations when you're with a C-suite um, individual, and then how we, how we kind of learn from that. And then you establish those mentee and mentor type roles, which I, I've always enjoyed um, a lot of why I do a lot of speaking engagements is I really like the interaction with um, people in the industry or people even outside the industry. And I always want to make sure that I give a lesson back, a lesson learned that someone could take away and not just have a 30,000 foot conversation. So speaking of lessons learned and someone who has mentored, I'm curious, what what is a piece of advice you were given early on in your career that you still use today? So early in my career, I think I, I was probably a little quieter of a leader. Um, I had a lot of conversations with the people I led, and I, wasn't, I didn't come into it as a, a leader. Obviously, I worked my way up through a technician level, you know, um, in operations. But I was a fairly young leader. So at like 24, 25, I was leading a group of eight people. And one of the things I learned very fast is if you go into a room with leaders who are older than you or have had a lot more years in the business, you have to be able to speak very clearly, make sure the message you're going to deliver is very well understood before you leave the room, and then you're, you're going to have to be willing to take the bad with the good. Um, you're not always going to get the feedback that you want. And as a young leader, I remember being devastated coming out of one of my first meetings going, they listened to nothing I said. I was totally pushed aside. I didn't add any value, and how I'm gonna how am I gonna recall this to take it back to my team to explain that we're doing the right thing? And I had a leader come up to me, and I I saw him as a very difficult person to work with at the time because he was just so strong. And he came in in a very quiet setting, and he said, "One thing you're gonna have to learn is someone has to know your value when you enter the room." And he said, "That's all about your brand." and what voice you carry. And he said, no, when you say something that you're intentional about it. So I was quite often would come in and as a science person, I was not always given the good news, right? I wasn't telling them they ran X number of financial data and they've exceeded their business quota. Most of the time I was impacting the business quota because we had product on hold or we had had an issue with a consumer. So I, I came in timidly most of the time trying to give that news. And he said, no matter what it is, you have to own it. And so he taught me to carry my voice a little differently when I come into meetings, but also even outside that, when you go to set the scale of who you are and what you bring to the team, you've got to be able to bring in good news with the bad. So he would often tell me, hey, I want you to write your job performance review before I do. I want to see how you grade yourself. I'm always my worst critic. So I'm always going to grade myself much worse then probably someone looking would understand that he said, you've got to make sure that you raise the bar. No matter if you come in and give yourself a meets expectation, they're probably going to think you're less than me because you don't care enough to tell them where you exceed. So he always tried to tell me, you know, you need to sell yourself. You need to have a strong voice. You need to own your brand. Like know who you are when you go in and what value you bring to the team. That is so important. I, I just... 
I'm sitting here wanting to just eat up everything you've just said. It's so important, <laughs> so, so important. And I feel it cannot be stressed enough. So I just want to wrap up with one last question, and it's also uh, similarly about mentorship, uh, almost in the same vein. So if you were to mentor a woman or women that were new to the industry, I'm thinking, you know, someone um, – envisioning like mid-20s, just graduated from college and getting ready to set foot in their first food and beverage company, what two or three pieces of advice would you give them? I think one simple thing that I was given by this same gentleman actually was write down all the stupid stuff that you run into for the first 60 to 90 days. Don't say it out loud, but write it down. And then go back after that 90 days and visualize all those questions you had in your head and say, do they, are they still relevant? Because that will really help you carry a very clear voice when you go in to ask questions. Not that you can't ask questions, but quite often we'll say, well, I don't understand why we're having to have a meeting every Friday. Or, you know, you don't want to over-challenge, but you don't want to under-execute um, either when you're asking really those hard questions. One, that was one thing, was about learn to be silent when silence is needed and learn, you know, to have a voice when a voice is needed. But also don't be frightened. Um, you know, fear can often derail anyone who has a goal, whether it's to be the next best machine operator or the need, need to be the, the next leader. And always reach high, a, a level higher than what you actually think that you're capable of. So if someone comes to you and says, hey, I, I see you're – you know, you're an operational supervisor on second shift on this initiative. You know, what's your next goal? What's, they'll always ask you, you know, what's your five-year goal? And no one really knows where they're going to be in five years. They have an aspiration. So always overachieve that by one level. Otherwise, I, I, he'd always say you're going to end at the level beneath of where you want in someone else's mind. You always got to have that next level, even though you, you know you might, have a little more growth to get there, be willing to take that. Um, you often hear the fake it till you make it or take it because you can. Um, there's a, a lot of people in the industry who say, oh, he just, he just got it because he was faking it till he made it. And where we women, we tend to be very calculated and we want to make sure that we can. There's an opportunity that sometimes you just have to take it and be willing to fail, be willing to step back and recognize what you could have done better, um, and it may require you to change a whole different role, or it may require you to take a role that's a lateral and not a move up for you to be able to mature as a leader and to be able to tackle those big business decisions. One thing I always take away, and it, it was a hard lesson learned early, is that no matter how difficult the situation is, and some of them are going to be awful. I mean, you're, you're never, never going to have a perfect day. You're always going to have days that you come out and you feel like, man, I could have done better, or you might have had really challenging discussions, or you might have a person that you're reporting to that's just difficult, right, and overly demanding, and you're feeling like you're not getting it. But there's always a lesson to take away from that, because no matter how hard that day is, there's going to be a day that's even harder, and you're going to learn how to get through this one. And those lessons learned is really what makes you a progressive leader and a leader who's willing to take those risks and really be calculated for the business because, you know, as scientists, we tend to be very conservative. So we all, if we can't statistically weigh it out where it makes sense, we're not going to do it, right? But there's the entrepreneurial behavior in order to really be successful in a business, you got to be willing to take those calculated risks. And you learn that through being in those really difficult situations. Like, so you know the sting is not really going to be as bad as you thought it might be because you've already been through something that might even be, be worse in the past. But it's just about don't crush your inner self and don't take things too heavy that you're not willing to take that next step. And I think as women sometimes the emotions get in the way of the business decision and that, that can be the unhinging moment. So you've got to reflect that this is a business decision, that it's, you know, it's not meant to be pers personal. It's got to be all strategic. We, we've got to have the best of, best of the business on our mind and our thoughts when we're making those decisions, be it difficult decisions or easy decisions. So 
I always found it hard in my my youth to be able to get over the the hinge of the emotional part that it's not personal. But once I remember the day really that that changed, um, I finally understood what it was to lead a business and not just you know think about the personal side of it or maybe be too crushed because I felt like I didn't produce the results that I really wanted to for the business. I know it's kind of a long way of getting to advice, but I think the biggest thing to take away is just be willing to take that next step risk and be willing to fail. You know, not everybody's perfect. And any leader, no matter how high they are, they can never look at you and say every day was great and I knew exactly what I was going to do when I grew up because I, I don't think that's ever anybody's um, goal. They, they look at it and they figure it out as they go. Um, you may graduate with an engineering degree and then never use that degree holistically. You may go into a whole different field, but what you learned gaining that degree and that experience is what let, leads you to that next role. So everything really has to be a, a learned evaluation. I always walk away from the bad days and go, okay, what did I learn today? And I think that's the biggest lesson that I could give someone. You know, don't walk away because it gets tough. Walk away when you know it's not a fit because that's a different reason for leaving. Glenn, it has been an absolute treat to get to talk to you today. And I want to, I just want to thank you for being on this special Influential Women in Food episode of the Food for Thought podcast. everyone listening to the Food for Thought podcast today, thank you for tuning in. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and just about everywhere you can listen to a podcast. Be sure to tune in next time as we talk more about the stories behind the headlines of the food and beverage industry. Take care. Have a great day.